A distinguished scientist and professor in both physics and chemistry, Dr. Steve Granick has been a leader in interdisciplinary research and was a recipient of prestigious awards from the American Physical Society in 2009 and the American Chemical Society in 2013. In January 2014, after serving as a Chair Professor of Material Science and Engineering at the University of Illinois, he was appointed as a Director of the Centre for Soft and Living Matter at the Institute for Basic Science, which carries out basic research to discover scientific principles and develop new materials. Stay tuned to meet Dr. Steve Granick, who is contributing to the advancement of basic science in Korea. Joining us today is Professor Steve Granick, one of the world's leading authorities in polymer physics. Today we'll be talking about the research in basic science, which forms the foundation for the scientific technologies which will go on to shape the future. And we'll talk about the outlook in this field as well. Steve, welcome to the interview. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And you're coming all the way from Ulsan, I believe. In the, rain, in the driving in rain. In the rain. Thank you so I'm much. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> uh, a long, long journey. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, I want to say a huge congratulations because not only did you recently become a member of the US National Academy of Sciences, mm -hmm. but you've also recently been elected as a member of the prestigious American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Yeah. Your fellow members, including over 250 Nobel prize winners and 60 Pulitzer Prize winners as well. So how does that feel? It feels like uh, somebody made a big mistake by letting <laughs> me in. <laughs> You're so modest. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel very happy. Yeah. Um, I, it opens up new chances mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, for all of us here in Korea. And also I, I'm very well, well aware that it was not given to one man, but to a whole team of people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in modern science, no person works alone. Uh, so I'm just, I'm a figurehead for a very brilliant and hardworking and creative group of people who change over the years. But as soon as I heard of the, the good news about these awards, I told them about it mm. because it's really in honor of what they did. Oh. And, giving credit to everyone on okay. your team, but a huge congratulations nonetheless. And yeah. can we expect to see your name on the Nobel Prize winners list in the near future? I hope one of them, not me. <laughs> <laughs> We shall see, we shall see. Well, you gave a lecture recently at the Strong Career Creative Forum yeah. titled The Global Trend of Basic Science. Could you give us some more details about the lecture? Well, um, I tried to explain some of my experiences here in Korea. Mm -hmm. I've learned so much about this fascinating country. Korea somehow doesn't see problems. It, when a Korean, I, in my experience, looks at anything he or she tries to think what is the solution mm. so this is what's happening in many ways and it's been such a revelation to me to see how korea is bursting into the world scene in so many ways mm -hmm. um, it started with k-pop and the tv dramas and this sort of thing yeah and we learned last month about korean literature with han kang um, and in science as well it's beginning with this very imaginative and brave and forward-looking Institute for Basic Science mm -hmm. that brought me here to Korea. So how is, I mean, is Korea one of the leading countries in basic science, would you say? Not yet. Not yet. But it's doing all the right things to become mm -hmm. that. Korea sees solutions and it's investing in its future. Okay, well, I know our viewers will be very curious about the lecture you gave at the Strong Korea Creative Forum, so mm -hmm. the interview crew went along to see what it was all about. The Strong Korea Creation Forum was held at a hotel in Seoul in the beginning of June under the slogan, the future of science and technology is dependent on basic research. Opinion leaders from various sectors attended the forum to discuss national and corporate growth engine. 
At the forum, Kim Duchar, the president of the Institute for Basic Science and other prominent figures in science and technology, advocated the promotion of basic science to pioneer deep learning and artificial intelligence technology. Steve Brennick brought to attention the importance of nurturing basic scientists, attracting competent foreign scientists and conducting research with a long-term perspective for the advancement of science and technology in Korea. Korea Very interesting indeed. So it seems that many scholars are predicting that basic science is going to become even more important amidst the fourth industrial revolution. Mm. But it is a field that I think often gets overlooked because of its lack of immediate economic impact. So mm. how would you go about convincing our viewers of the importance of basic science? Well, it's a fair question. Um, why should we work towards not tomorrow and not next week, but towards our future and our children's future eventually. Mm. If you want the garden to look beautiful tomorrow or next week, then the thing to plant is grass mm -hmm. or maybe bamboo here. If we want to have a, the best garden in the future and the strongest trees and the best possible fruit in the future, it takes longer. If we could imagine, it, now we have, we're sitting in a very well-lit well city and it's so beautiful at night to go outside in Seoul. Not so long ago, Seoul was lit by candles. Mm -hmm. And I try to imagine myself sometimes, if I had been a scientist at that time, and people would say, why don't you work on candles? You know, I would have, if I had listened to them, I would make bigger candles or smaller candles or red candles or blue candles, but never would we have electricity. Mm. So we're working for the electricity of the future. Right. So this is the investment part. So investing in the future, in the new, the next technologies. The next technology and a better life. Right. More than technology. Indeed. So and... We're investing in a way to think. So Korea, there's a phrase I hear more and more often in Korea about being a fast follower. Mm -hmm. But Korea as a country has been such a good fast follower that it doesn't find who to follow anymore. Right. It's decided, it realizes it has to be a fast leader. Mm -hmm. But how do you decide to lead? How do you learn how to think in a way that will lead productively. Mm. This is hard. So that's if, what you're trying to promote, really? We want to, yes, mm -hmm. I hope. So when you asked me, and I know you were joking, do I expect a Nobel Prize? Of course not. But the kind of thinking that one day will lead to a Korean Nobel Prize mm -hmm. must come from this kind of fast leading. Okay, so I understand that during your lecture at the Strong Korea Creative Forum, you mm. discussed a wide range of measures in order to help promote basic science. So mm. what are some of those measures and which would you say is the most important? Well, in the forum I described, I sort of semi-facetiously, I, I gave, asked people to predict a Nobel Prize winner. Okay and I gave them different options. Who would they choose? So the first option was someone who's working in a very popular field that already saw one or two Nobel Prize winners. Mm -hmm. So would you bet on someone in that field? Okay. And my opinion is no. Mm. The prizes are already given in that field and precisely because it's recognized as so important, the future prizes won't come from there. Mm. Okay. We have to think in science the way that K-pop, 
the way that this wonderful piece of literature, the vegetarian, was imagined. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it's not derivative of anyone else's work. It's invented here. So we have to teach people to think of what they can invent coming from the particular I new ideas here. Okay. So you said Korea is kind of on the cusp of becoming a leader, of, a leader in basic science, or it's wanting to go in that direction. So who is the world leader or who's investing the most money and time into basic science at the moment then? Well, Korea is a small country, so it's not the correct measure to say how much money, mm. but it's investing heavily and it's in almost 30 different areas now. It's scattering good sized centers in different research institutions around the country mm -hmm. with people who are very carefully selected to be leaders in those fields. So it has the center itself and then it has the intellectual synergy of the other university or research institute around it. Mm -hmm. It's doing all the right things. Okay. So let's talk more about the research results of the Institute for Basic Science Center for Soft and Living Matter, which you head yes. over at the Ulsan National Institute for Science and Technology. And as I understand it, you actually spent 30 years at the University of Illinois prior to this, yes. um, most recently as the chair professor of material science and engineering. Uh -huh. Why did you decide to make that transition from Illinois to Korea? Had you had any ties with Korea beforehand? The biggest reason to me was that when I thought about it, the chance to come here and start this very ambitious program could not be turned down. Mm. It was too good to refuse. But many people think don't know korea they think it's a small and distant country mm -hmm. they just assume the center of the best science in the world must be in europe or the us that's no longer true mm -hmm. um, also in china there's great science and in japan there's great science the west doesn't realize just how quickly the world is changing All right did you have any difficulties when you came, though, or any obstacles that you had to face? Well, I'm learning Korean only slowly. Okay. <laughs> slowly but surely. <laughs> but um, I enjoy the culture very much. Mm -hmm. The food is much better than hamburgers. <laughs> and the scenery, the ocean, the mountains, the the culture more generally, walking mm. around. I no, I'm not complaining about anything. The people are very warm and mm -hmm. welcoming and do their best to accept me and make me feel welcome. Okay. So UNIST uh, is still a fairly young university. It's only been about seven years yeah. since its opening, I believe. Uh, but it's quickly gained inter international prestige um, by attracting some of the most world-renowned scholars such as yourself. And the IBS in particular um, is kind of aggressively attracting overseas talent um, to work as part of your key research teams. Mm -hmm. Why is the IBS in particular going about it in, in such a way? Well, science is international and talent is international. I don't want to keep coming back to Nobel Prizes, but I, I know the US is admired sometimes because it has more than 300 Nobel Prizes. Mm -hmm. It seems enormous. Less well appreciated is that more than 100 of them, a third, are from given to people who were not born in the U.S. Right. So this is a way that the U.S. has followed for many, many years. The nation grew this way from immigrants. And Korea realizes this obvious fact. Um, ideas that are international, people are fluid. The brain drain should not only be from Korea to the West. Mm -hmm. It should be both ways. Okay. Well, we were lucky enough to be given a tour of the Institute for mm -hmm. Basic Science, where the world's leading scientists and engineers conduct their studies in basic science. So let's take a look at this video clip. 
The Institute for Basic Science, IBS for short, was established in 2011 by the Ministry of Science, ICT and Future Planning, based on the Special Act on the Establishment and Support of the International Science Business Belt. With the aim of acquiring new knowledge and original technologies through basic research projects, IBS nurtures research talent and provides researchers with an excellent research environment to generate fruitful results. While the primary focus is on the fundamental sciences, such as physics, chemistry, life sciences, mathematics and interdisciplinary research, is also carried out as long-term and large-scale projects. I knew that IBS is a very high-quality research centre, whilst they can offer you really high technologies, a lot of new instruments. But here the people are very successful. Of course, the mentality of the Korean people is a little bit different. So, which is a very nice experience for me. There are currently 26 research centers with a total of 720 Korean and 180 foreign researchers. So, it's called the Center for Soft and Living Matter. What exactly is that? Okay, well, think of the last time you took a ride on an airplane. Okay. We study all the things you're not allowed to bring on the airplane. Such as? The toothpastes, the cosmetic creams, the jar of water or juice, mm. the pet gerbil, pet snake. <laughs> right. All the things in the world around us that we, among which we live and which are essential for our lives and which the more you think about them, the less you really understand. Mm. So when I was a kid, I never liked my science classes. Is that so? Oh, it's perfectly so. <laughs> I hated them. You know, chemistry seemed very dry mm. and formulaic, and physics was memorizing formulas and, you know, etc. Yeah. And it was just pigeonholed. It was textbooks, and I didn't understand how it could connect to the life around me. Right. So when I had a chance to have my own laboratory, I decided we don't have to follow the textbooks that way. Mm. Let's study daily life. And it, it makes our life harder sometimes because we can't say we are just this or this or this, chemist, physicist, something else. Mm -hmm. We have to know it all, but it makes, makes life more interesting right. and gives us a chance to contribute more because we all care about our own daily life. Of course. So there's a lot of interdisciplinary yes. study and research as well then. It's the heart of the matter, yeah. Right, okay. Um, and what are, the, what are some of the social and scientific impacts of your work in soft and living matter? Well, we all want to be healthy. Mm -hmm. This is daily life. We all want cheap energy, daily life. Yeah. We care about the climate. We care about air pollution. We care about good food better cosmetics, mm -hmm. um, it's, the list is endless right. of technologies that impact our daily life. So if we can understand how the world is put together in, in these ways, mm. the connections to technology are very close. It's interesting because when I think of scientific research, I think of things that, are, that go way over my head, yeah. you know, but me too. The way you put it, um, it, you know, it just seems like you're looking for simple solutions to simple problems. We're very simple-minded. <laughs> and yes, exactly. Mm. And it always surprises me because I know that there's so many more intelligent scientists out there. The difference between scientists is how they choose their problems. Right, right. And by this field of soft and living matter somehow has been forgotten mm. in, the, in, the, in the schools. It sits between the disciplines. Right. It, you use the word interdisciplinary. Nowadays, we hear more often the word convergent. Right. Um, so bringing everything together. It's necessary to bring everything together. Mm. And 
so little has been done that there remains so much to do. This is a fantastic time for young researchers to enter this field because they can contribute so much. Mm, very exciting stuff. Yeah. And last year, the IBS Center for Soft and Living Matter published a paper regarding intracellular movement yeah. in the International Journal Nature Materials. Yeah. Could you explain, in a very basic way, for okay. myself and our viewers, what is meant by intracellular movement, first of all? Think of little apartments right. inside a great big city. Mm -hmm. And even inside the apartment, you have to move from room to room and you have to cook the food and you have to find the sleeping to renew yourself and so on. Yeah. So obviously we have to move around. That's, that's what we were studying. How do cells move things around inside them? When I first came to Incheon mm -hmm. and I walked into a taxi to find my hotel, this was before GPS. So the poor taxi driver wasn't quite sure where to go. Right. So he, he went to where he thought the hotel was, but that was wrong. Mm -hmm. So he looked around and he didn't find it. And he went to somewhere else where he thought it was. And he looked it around and didn't find it. And this proceeded for about 45 minutes until oh. we finally found my hotel. Okay. This we discovered is what we were turned the problem the cell was facing when we were studying transport inside it. Right. Because the cell is not intelligent and it didn't know where to find the correct destinations for its cargo. Mm. And it turns out when all was said and done and we'd done a lot of work and struggled a lot, we decided the cell was finding its destinations more or less like my poor taxi driver was. <laughs> so by luck? Well, but not exactly luck, a very clever luck. Okay. Because the taxi driver didn't just aimlessly look. Mm -hmm. He would make a big jump into a different neighborhood and look around, and then he'd make another jump to another neighborhood right. and look around. It was not... There was system to his madness. Okay. And he found it. Right, so our bodies, our cells within our bodies do it's, a similar thing. It's programmed into what we do. Okay. So without being, without thinking, the cell is intelligent. And that's what we learned, that the cell somehow is programmed to follow rules mm. that end up being as intelligent as a sole taxi driver. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating. It's we learn from it, yeah. yeah. And now that we know it, we can imagine applying it to other designing new forms of materials right. and potentially new technologies and solving problems that we didn't know existed mm. until we did the study. Wow. So what's the significance of this discovery then? What kind of applications um, do you foresee? Well, in the short term, that's not our goal. Our mm. goal is to understand daily life. Mm -hmm. And this was one example of daily life. But now that we can see that it's possible to program very simply this intelligence without really thinking mm. into this very function, very useful operation, we can imagine using it in new technologies. Can you give us an example, maybe? No, it's too soon. Too soon. Too soon. Okay. No, we're planting gardens. Planting gardens, sorry. We're not planting bamboo. We're planting trees that take time to grow. I see. And we're not quite sure when we'll see the results of the gardening quite yet, or how. Well, we're sure it won't be tomorrow or okay. yesterday. Right. Um, and how long did it take you to achieve these research results? I'm sure there was a lot of manpower and funding also that was required. Not really. This was um, one or two students, especially, but very strong-willed, curious students who didn't give up easily. Mm. So along, not a lot of man, uh, funding either. Uh, simply their time and their energy and their creativity. They didn't go into the problem knowing what they would find. Right. They wanted to know. They imagined 
they asked very innocently, we think we can make this measurement to see how cargo gets delivered inside a cell. Mm. Can we measure where it goes and how long it takes and, and do it for lots and lots of different cases? And then can we see the pattern? Mm. And that was so hard. So there were so many times they might have given up mm. and looked for something quicker and easier, but they didn't. And the driving person behind that, in the end, actually did something very, very useful. Which but was? But in a paradoxical way, it was useful to him. Okay. So he's now a professor at Stanford University right. in the U.S., which is one of the very best universities in the world by any one standard. Of course, yeah. If he had set himself as a goal of be becoming that professor, I'm pretty sure he would have failed. But when he set himself a goal of very honestly achieving the best science he could, mm. that's what led to his success. And it was useful already for this man and also I could go through the other authors of this study. For each of them, in their personal lives, mm -hmm. it had already good impact. So when you and your students do the research then, are you simply kind of just looking at life, at living matter, not with a particular end goal in mind? Is that what you're saying? We are exploring we, of course, we begin with ideas mm. and we begin with puzzles. But if we do our job right, the question will change okay. and it will mature and it will become better. And in the course of the study, if we do it correctly, the, what we observe will not make sense to us mm -hmm. and it will force us to redefine the problem to be a better problem than we than that with which we began. So that certainly happened in this study. Mm -hmm. Another study I'm not involved in at all, but one of the group leaders in our center, uh, Bartosz Szybowski, who was a professor at Northwestern University in the US, he's very interested in chemistry, in performing chemical reactions very efficiently and cheaply. He's also a little lazy, <laughs> so he doesn't want to just try and see what works, but he decided to feed into a computer all of human knowledge mm -hmm. about chemistry, about synthesis. It's amazing. Yeah, but is that this, even possible? It took a long time, and right. people told him it's not possible, he should give up, but he's very stubborn. <laughs> and it works now. So he has the chemistry version of AlphaGo. Right. And there are reasons that it's even more difficult than AlphaGo mm. for chemistry. People told him to give up, but he refused. And now it works. And the technological usefulness is obvious. Yeah. Huge companies are standing in line to use his what now becomes a technology. Mm. But it began because he refused to listen to what wiser and older people told him to do. Right, but it sounds like there's actually quite a lot of freedom in what you want to research. And this is designed into the IBS system. Mm. And so when you asked me, what is, how is Korea comparing and stacking up to other countries? Yeah. This is so special here it in is. Korea. They are trusting us, and it's a huge responsibility. We mm. have to work very hard. But I believe it's also necessary. And Zhabowski needed the time to show that his critics were wrong. Right. And, I mean, the results speak for themselves, really. They do. Um, yeah. yeah, fantastic system. And I hear that you're also undertaking research to develop new materials. Uh -huh. How would you define new materials, and what's the reasoning behind uh, researching this particular field? Well... Material is just a fancy word for stuff we use in daily life. Mm -hmm. So we have another study that will be published in probably next month about a new kind of material, which is what we call active. So most 
most of what we use in life is, is dead. Okay. The glass of water mm -hmm. just sits there, and the table just sits there, and look around the room. It, things just, they're created for a purpose, and they work very well, and then they sit there. But we decided, and many other people in the world are interested now, in materials that move around on their own, mm -hmm. and they're not at what we call equilibrium. So we decided to, how can we teach them to be teams? So birds will form flocks of birds, mm -hmm. or fish will form schools of fish. Could we teach materials to do that as well? And could we make them change from one, maybe a swarm of one thing to a wave pattern or mm. to a string pattern with the same starting material? That was our goal, and we, we found a way, and with our collaborators who uh, at Northwestern University, my friend Eric Lauten, by computer simulation, they generalized it even beyond the experiments we had done mm. and found that it was much more powerful than we knew. So this is a new kind of material that is looking for a new use. We don't know yet. Okay. But I'm trying to wrap my head around this. What exactly is the material? Oh, our material is little... Okay, we chose one example, which is just a little piece of glass, mm -hmm. a little sphere of glass, much smaller than our hair. Okay. If we put maybe a hundred of them in a line, they would be the width of one of our hair. Wow. So that's just what we chose. And we found a way to do it, to make them act as teams, mm. to form waves, to form uh, rings, to form swarms like flies, and go in between those different alternatives. Right. That's... And now we know it's possible, then we can dream of other material, applying mm. it to more other things than our little pieces of glass. That's absolutely astounding. So can this be applied to other materials as well? Oh yes, oh yes. And of course we always begin with some simple system where because we don't know it will work. Mm. And so we keep things as simple as possible. Now we know it works. Mm. We can scale up, we can teach it to robots, we can imagine all kinds of possibilities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's pretty mind-blowing, actually, to think of some of the things that, that you can do with seemingly dead materials, as you said before. Well, we're trying lots and lots of different ideas, and I know some people ask me sometimes, what is the purpose of your center? What mm. do you tell your people to work on? And that is not the way we operate. To me, the much more effective way is to bring very clever and creative people together and say, you are free. Mm. We will talk, of course, and we will criticize each other. We'll be our worst critics yeah. internally. But if you have a good idea, you can follow it. Mm -hmm. And I've been giving you now three examples of good ideas. Yeah, There are many more. And my job is to not get in the way, right. to find those talented people and encourage them to follow their genius. Mm -hmm. And just find the beauty of discovery. And when we discover in this field of soft and living matter, the applications become evident. Indeed. So let's talk about you specifically. You're known as one of the most prolific foreign researchers in Korea. What drives you personally to conduct so many studies and keep researching? I'm curious about the world. And we're so lucky that um, science is so interesting mm. and daily life in the form of soft matter and living systems are... This is the golden age mm -hmm. when we have the tools to be able to study them and not just wonder, not just speculate. And yet the problems have 
remain to be solved. Mm -hmm. So yes, I have a passion for curiosity. And you began by mentioning these prizes that came my way. I don't want them to be the best thing that ever happened in my life. And okay. The rest will be downhill. I want it to be even better in the future. Mm -hmm. Not in sense of prizes, but in the sense of interesting new science. And as I was just explaining, I don't tell people what to do. Mm. I want to encourage them to develop in their ways. So when you say, I'm so prolific, I would rather say, no, I encourage other people to be prolific. And I try to create the environment where people will be prolific. Mm. You've also worked as a guest professor and visiting professor at various uh, universities around the world yeah. uh, in countries such as the USA, France, China, Japan, as well as Korea, yeah. obviously. Uh, was there any particular reason you wanted to teach at so many different places? Oh, the world is such a fascinating place. So I feel so lucky to be have a, a job which, in which part of the job means we should travel. Mm. We exchange ideas when I'm sure if you and I sat down, we would, I would find fascinating things from your experiences and you would have suggestions for me. This is part of the process of science. So it's, I have these career reasons to go to other countries and learn from other people. Mm. And, and also it's such a pleasure to travel and to see different lands. Mm -hmm. So is it part of your future plans to travel to more countries as well? Is, oh, every... I know you're in Korea right now, but I mean, would you want to think about expanding your horizons in the future even more? Well, I have a, I will stay in Korea for at least 10 years. Wow, uh, okay. This is the IBS system. I told you this is not just a short-term project. Mm. Uh, it, we're taking it very, very seriously. But for scientific exchange, yes, uh, all the time. And is there anything that you would like to say to any aspiring engineers or scientists out there? Follow your passion. Trust yourself. And don't just follow the textbooks. You'll never be the smartest person but if you take a little piece from here, a little piece from there, go in between disciplines, take a convergent attitude, there's so much, the possibilities are unlimited. Mm. And what are the future plans for the IBS? Well, we've only begun. Mm -hmm. we, I moved to Korea a year and a half ago so the best is in the in the future. Okay. And we're enjoying our enjoying starting to see our garden grow. And you did mention that you want to achieve much more in the future than what you've already yeah. uh, accomplished. So what what would you say your personal goal or dream is in life? I want to see my students do much better than I do. Okay. And to me, the, this is the way that we will have impact beyond whatever we do this year or next year. We're educating students and postdocs and people who work with us, and they will go on to do many things in the future for decades. Mm -hmm. And they will have their students. And this is how science propagates. The words of a true teacher and leader, I think. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm so, so excited to, to know what the IBS and in particular the Centre for Soft and Living Matter will discover in the near future. Uh, okay. So please keep us posted. I'll be on the lookout as well. And best of luck in your endeavours and to your students as well who you keep <laughs> mentioning, which I think is absolutely amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much yeah. for joining us today yeah. on the interview, Thank Steve. You.